11. Systematic Anthropology Faith and belief in Scripture mean hearing and obeying the Word of God. They mean not mere intellectual assent, but the submission, the reliance on, and the development and reshaping of our whole being in terms of God's law word. Paul makes clear that unbelief is not a lack of the knowledge of God, but a refusal to submit to God's lordship and authority out of unrighteousness. Romans chapter 1, verses 17 to 20. Man rejects God's authority and lordship in favour of his own. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. This is unbelief in the biblical sense. The consequence of this revolt against God is the perversion of man. Homosexuality is presented by Paul as the burning out of apostate man. Romans chapter 1 verse 27. Burned out. The life of the reprobate man is a life of hatred against all authority. Romans chapter 1 verses 29 to 32. The reprobate hate God, they hate parents, they boast of themselves, and they are implacably hostile to all authority. Then Paul makes clear why there can be no word and no salvation from man. First, both God and fallen man have a word, a system, and a plan of judgment. In Romans chapter 2, Paul contrasts the judgments of the ungodly and their inherent plan and system with the judgments of God. Man the sinner presents himself as the judge, but Paul says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. Romans chapter 2 verse 1 Man apart from God, whether in or out of the church, is under judgment. Man under God is living in terms of God's word and in faithfulness to God's law. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Romans chapter 2 verse 25 Status before God is on God's terms only. It begins with sovereign grace and reveals itself by keeping God's law. Second, man's system and word are products of depravity, not wisdom. There is none righteous, no, not one, and there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 12. Their words spring from a poisoned well. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Romans chapter 3 verse 13. Paul cites verse after verse from the Old Testament to sum up God's judgment on man. Every system of thought devised by man is thus from a poisoned well and under judgment. This is especially true of Phariseeism, which uses the law, interpreted to mean humanistic goals, as a means of justification but no man is justified by works. No man earns an independence from God by his own actions. Romans chapter 3, verses 20 to 30. Salvation brings freedom, not from God, but from judgment and reprobation. The redeemed are now free from sin and death, the consequence of their own system. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 and are totally under God's dominion and law. Hence, faith does not make void the law. God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Romans chapter 3 verse 31 The law is now established over and in us as God's way, and an aspect of his system and eternal decree. What Paul makes clear is that, because of his depravity, there is no tenable system from fallen man. Fallen man simply works out the implications of his depravity in his life. Romans chapter 1 verse 24 and in his thought. Romans chapter 1 verses 21 to 23. 
Man's system is, in essence, the tempter's thesis in Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 5. First, there is no sure word of God. Yea, hath God said, and no assured decree of predestination. Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 and 4. Man lives in an open universe, and the potentiality of man is the essence of that openness. The limitless potentiality and actuality of God make the universe totally open to God, a closed realm to rebellious man. For the universe to be open must mean, fallen man holds, that the limitless potentiality must be transferred to man. The system replacing God's eternal and foreordained decree is man's potential and existential decree. Second, logically, this means that man, not the Lord, is God. Hence, the culminating point of the temptation is that man shall be as God. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 A new government, God, and law shall prevail. This requires a systematics of man, a systematic anthropology. As a result, the mind of man becomes a matter of great concern. The psychology of man gains great attention from humanism because the ultimate point of reference, potentiality and coherence, is the supposedly autonomous mind of man. Primitive tribes, perverts, mental defectives, criminals, children and adults, all varieties of men are painstakingly studied in order to give man the raw materials for the new systematics. Not surprisingly, modern anthropology began with Charles Darwin. As Dompier stated it, It is hardly too much to say that modern anthropology arose from the origin of species. Politics becomes the practical sphere of action of every systematic anthropology because it is through politics that man seeks to apply the humanistic decree of predestination to man and the world. Basic to the idea of systematics is the fact that it has inherent in it the element of necessity. For the Orthodox Christian, things are ordered by God and have, in and behind them, the necessity of God's decree. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 this necessity is not only in their own lives, but in all things, for Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Acts chapter 15 verse 18 The goal of systematic anthropology, modern politics, is to substitute the decree of man for the decree of God. More than one humanistic group in society have looked to the ant hill and the beehive as the model state, all things exist by order and plan, so it is held should man, but the source of the plan must be man himself. Man must remake himself and his world in terms of his own autonomous will. Theological writings in the modern world are thus political writings, and the most influential preaching in the modern era is political speaking. In the 1970s, the United States has seen an American president, Carter, disavow any Christian influence on his decisions while professing to be a born-again Christian, and at the same time affirm a humanistic doctrine of human rights with religious seal. The systematic anthropology of Carter and of other self-professed Christian politicians is a very clear one. It is thus a serious error on the part of churchmen to look for modern challenges to the systematic theology of biblical faith from church sources only. Such challenges, however real and important, do not represent the main challenge. Systematics has on the whole left the church for politics. The political thought of Soviet theoreticians is rigorous in its attempt to be systematic 
and Western political theorists are no less dedicated. It is, moreover, a requirement for systematic theology to place every area of life and thought under the jurisdiction of God the Sovereign and His law word. Polytheism openly posits many gods, and hence many jurisdictions. As a result, a particular god could be escaped by leaving his jurisdiction. Hence the Syrians of old held of Israel. Their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 23 We find, however, similar opinions in many church circles. Christianity and the state must be kept strictly separate, a very different idea than the separation of church and state. The one posits a religious and theological division, the other an institutional one. Other churches insist on seeing the state as exclusively secular, and hence under reason, not scripture. Thus, we are told by a Lutheran in a review of a work by F. A. Schaeffer. Similarly, one finds in the author a typically reformed desire to structure government according to biblical and even Christian principles. He would like to see the Bible made the law book of the land, if not literally, at least indirectly. He describes with approval Paul Roberts' mural Justice Lifts the Nations, with justice unblindfolded and pointing her sword downward toward a book which is written, The Law of God, and adds, To whatever degree a society allows the teaching of the Bible to bring forth its natural conclusions, it is able to have form and freedom in society and governments. While we indeed recognise the scriptural truth that righteousness exalteth the nation, Proverbs chapter 14 verse 34, we must affirm that human reason the natural knowledge of God's law and the power of the sword, not the revealed word of God, are basic principles for secular governments. To hold that there is one kind of faith and obedience in the church and another in the state is hardly in agreement with Scripture. The systematic anthropology which manifests itself in politics links to itself modern science that is, post-Darwinian evolutionary science, as the basics of the new faith. Scientific politics is to provide the new decree of predestination, the new source of authority and power, the new decree of election and reprobation. Failure to see this fact means irrelevance to the triune God and his word. It means that we have a Neoplatonic church theology which holds its doctrines in abstraction from the real world, from that unity which constitutes the God-given creation. The more that Neoplatonic faith abstracts itself from the context of the material world, the clearer and the higher its ostensible spirituality. Neoplatonic religion will thus produce an abstract theology in which irrelevance is a mark of purity. Its doctrines will become Neoplatonic ideas, and the church will become a monastery or a convent, a place where withdrawal from the context of the world is a virtue. The modernist, however, will seek relevance, but again, on Platonic terms. Marx, after Hegel, saw the idea or world spirit as dominating the historical process, so that history became the idea The state is the idea in time, and hence the relevance of the particulars is denied in favour of the idea, the state. The ruthlessness of modernist social action in condemning capitalists, fundamentalists, Calvinists, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, quote, fascists, end quote, all their opponents, and others, speaks of contempt for the matter of history as against the idea, the state, Even more than systematic anthropology, systematic theology must include law, politics, work and calling, the arts and sciences, and more. There are no limitations on the sovereignty of the triune God, 
nor on his jurisdiction. To mark off systematic theology as an area having the church and its doctrines as its province is to manifest polytheism. Universality or Catholicity is the mark of God's kingdom. But modern man has surrendered it to philosophy first and now to the state. The surrender is sin and heresy. Not until systematic anthropology is replaced by a truly systematic theology can churchmen call themselves Christian 